the big claims that Andrew Tate just made to reporters, how even nonprofit hospitals are screwing you, bring down this absolutely wild Alec Murdoch situation, huge updates in the Tyree Nichols tragedy. We've got all of that to talk about and so much more in today's brand new extra, extra large Philip DeFranco show. So buckle up, hit that like button to let me know you like these big shows and let's just jump into it. Andrew Tate just made his first public appearance and statement since being detained in Romania. Right, of course, Tate and his brother Tristan were arrested last month and detained on allegations that they were involved with human trafficking, rape, and organized crime. And while his Twitter account has remained active and said things like his only friends at night are cockroaches, lice, and bed bugs, this was the first time the two brothers got to directly speak to reporters so we knew who was actually saying it while they were escorted into the offices of the Romanian Directorate for investigating organized crime and terrorism. My money, that is why I'm in jail. I have money that they are trying to steal. Wrong. They know we've done nothing wrong. The Andrew, case file is completely is the empty. matrix they're making you? Andrew, what's happened in prison? The case file is completely empty. Of course it's unjust. There's no justice in Romania, unfortunately. Did you hurt any girl? Of course not. With both of the Tates also making some more comments as they were being escorted out. Ask the police what evidence they have against me. It's nothing. They're holding me because of media pressure. You are okay? They are persecuting me because I'm rich and successful. Now the matrix is trying to frame me, but God knows hey, the truth. Please. There's no evidence in my files that I've done nothing wrong. Everybody knows I'm innocent. But as far as what actually happens next in this case, uh, you have the Tate brothers set to remain in detention until at least late February. And that, after a judge extended their detention by 30 days last Friday. The Tates, of course, appealing both their initial detention and the seizure of their assets from their compound, but both have been rejected. But for now, we're going to have to wait to see what comes from these investigations, as well as what happens at the end of the 30 days. And then, all five cops involved in the death of Tyree Nichols have now been charged with second-degree murder, which is notably short of the first degree that his family demanded, but also far more likely they would actually be able to get a conviction. Along with those charges, we're seeing charges for aggravated assault, aggravated kidnapping, official misconduct, and official oppression. They've also all been arrested and sent to county jail, with Memphis's police chief promising to release the body cam footage from the violent traffic stop between Tyree and those cops in the coming days. Like I said yesterday, I do not know what the reaction's going to be, because the, the description of what's on that video is horrific. So horrible, the response was widely condemned, even by their own police force, which fired them a week after Tyree died. Or Tyree's family saying the video showed him being beaten like a human pinata. And of course, there is more to come, but since we talked about this yesterday, I wanted to make sure that I provided an update today. And then, Trump's getting his Facebook and Instagram back. Right, two years after he was banned from both platforms, you know, the, the small matter of inciting a whole ass violent insurrection, Meta announcing yesterday that yes, they are reinstating him, with the company saying in a blog post that the suspensions would be lifted in the coming weeks, but with new guardrails in place to deter repeat offenses. Specifically, Meta saying that because of Trump's violations of its community standards, he will face heightened penalties for repeat offenses under new protocols for public figures whose accounts are reinstated stated from suspensions related to civil unrest, and adding that in the event that Mr. Trump posts further violating content, the content will be removed and he will be suspended for between one month and two years, depending on the severity of the violation. The company also stated its updated protocols address content that doesn't violate its community standards, but quote, contributes to the sort of risk that materialized on January 6th, such as content that delegitimizes an upcoming election or is related to QAnon. Now, notably, unlike direct violations, that content would just have its distribution limited, but it wouldn't be taken down. Also, the penalty for repeat offenses here being that Meta may temporarily temporarily restrict access to our advertising tools. And as far as why are they doing this, also why specifically right now, it explained that it had addressed whether or not to extend the unprecedented two-year suspension it placed on Trump back in January of 2021 and determined that the risk to public safety had sufficiently receded. With Meta also arguing that social media is, quote, rooted in the belief that open debate and the free flow of ideas are important values, saying that it doesn't want to get in the way of open public and democratic debate and adding, the public should be able to hear what their politicians are saying, the good, the bad, and the ugly, so that they can make informed choices at the ballot box. Now, uh, of of course, with this, we saw the expected backlash, many noting that this ban has not stopped him from spewing lies about the election. Right? He's just been doing so on Truth Social since his ban. In fact, two top advocacy groups in the space recently estimated that over 350 of Trump's posts on the platform would have explicitly violated Facebook's policies against QAnon content, election claims, and harassment of marginalized groups. Which is why you have a lot of people saying that Meta shouldn't do this, that Trump still poses a threat, including the likes of NAACP President Derek Johnson, who condemned Meta's decision, saying, Mark Zuckerberg's decision to reinstate Trump's accounts is a prime example of putting profits over people's safety. It's quite astonishing that one can spew hatred, fuel conspiracies, and incite a violent insurrection at our nation's Capitol building, and Mark Zuckerberg still believes that is not enough to remove someone from his platform. This was also echoed by other experts who argue this isn't just a U.S. thing, saying this will have worldwide ramifications because it shows authoritarian leaders that they can manipulate Facebook to their will. But also, of course, on the other side, you have plenty of Trump supporters and conservatives cheering on this move, saying that this is a win for free speech, saying this shouldn't have happened in the first place and it should not happen again in the future. And that's something Trump himself also hit on in a post on
on Truth Social, where he claimed that Facebook had lost billions of dollars both removing and reinstating him and adding, such a thing should never happen to a sitting president or anybody else who is not deserving of retribution. And with this going on to praise Truth Social. And so actually with that, you have people going, well, is he actually going to go back to Facebook and Instagram? He hasn't gone back to Twitter yet, right? Elon Musk reinstated him a while ago. And personally, I think the answer is really fucking obvious. Of course he will go back at some point. Right? You have places like Axios noting, hey, if Trump goes back, you know, it sends a signal to investors of Truth Social that he's not confident in the company. The only things that Donald Trump cares about is Donald Trump and winning. Why would he not use those tools? Why would he not use those platforms where he has millions and millions of followers? Because at the same time, he'll be able to use his presence. There is a way to get even more people over to Truth Social, or at least that can at least be the smoke screen to justify why he's going back. I just can't imagine a world where he doesn't take advantage of this. But hey, that's a story and we'll have to wait to see how things play out. And I mean that both in what is Trump going to do and also what are the platforms going to do? Because uh, it's easy to say that there are rules and guardrails and then there's a it's a whole other thing to actually enforce it. And then hospitals are coming for your money or as my grandma used to say, they gonna run your pockets, ho. Rest in peace. Granny D. But you're gonna say, Phil, that's not anything new. I'm scared to get in an ambulance because I'd almost rather die than be in debt forever. Also, if this sounds extremely alien to you, welcome to America. But it's the specifics of this story that matter because not all hospitals are equal, or at least they're not supposed to be. Right? Because as it turns out, a Times investigation found that nonprofit hospitals are divesting themselves of their charitable roots in favor of more profitable pursuits. So you might not know this, but around half of the nation's hospitals are nonprofits, meaning that they're getting those juicy benefits like a billion dollar tax break. However, like Uncle Ben said, with great tax breaks comes great responsibility. In exchange for these massive, massive tax breaks, the IRS requires these nonprofit hospitals to provide services like free care to the poor to better their communities. But as it turns out, Providence, one of the largest chains of nonprofit hospitals, they didn't like that idea of not squeezing every single dime out of every sick or injured person. So they actually made a detailed playbook for their staff on how to pressure patients into paying. And if that didn't work and they still didn't pay, Providence reportedly would send debt collectors after them, meaning that poorer patients are now saddled with medical debt that they simply can't afford and shouldn't have in the first place, which is directly contradictory to Providence's founding principle, steadfast in serving all, especially those who are poor and vulnerable. Just to fully frame this properly, Providence was started by a group of nuns who wanted to help poor people, and right now they're reportedly sitting on $10 billion of investments, which by the way, is less than half their total revenue in 2021. And Providence's total spending on charity care was less than 1% of its expenses in 2021. And even before their profit focus program kicked in in 2018, it was 1.24%. Now, here's the thing. Federal law does not state who is eligible for free care, but certain states, including Washington, where Providence is based, do have rules on who qualifies. And in February of last year, the Washington State Attorney General filed a lawsuit against Providence, saying that they violated state law by sending debt collectors to more than 55,000 patients for a total of more than $73 million. And the chief executive of Providence even called the title nonprofit a misnomer in an industry publication two years ago, saying it is tax-exempt health care. It still makes profit. Kindly go fuck yourself, sir. The head of Providence, an organization meant to take care of the sick and the poor, makes eight figures a year. And actively hounding and harassing poor people has become the business model. But also, the thing is, it's not just Providence looking to do this. Right? Another nonprofit healthcare chain has the highest profit margins of any hospital in Virginia, with just one hospital reportedly making $100 million a year. And reportedly, the IRS has long known what's up, with a commissioner writing to the Senate in 2005, some tax-exempt healthcare providers may not differ markedly from for-profit for providers and their operations, their attention to the benefit of the community or their levels of charity care. Like the general idea of these nonprofits and the tax breaks, all of that is, you know, you, if you make money, you reinvest it so you can help your community. You know, then we see examples of hospitals being bought up. All of a sudden, hey, we have more money. Let's make more clinics. But then for some reason, those clinics are only being built in wealthier areas where people have private health insurance. And I'll actually link to it in the description. The, the New York Times has a fantastic piece on this. And these new ones are being built with like marble water fountains and golf carts to get patients here and there. But ultimately, here Here's the thing. There is no way that they are going to change their behavior unless the government and specifically the IRS cracks down on them because these nonprofit hospitals are going to ride the line as much as they can and even go past the line and then afterwards, you know, pay fees if they actually get held accountable. And even though we do see instances of that happening, largely they're not held accountable. But like I said, if you want to dive even further in this, uh, I'll link to it down below. But this is also something that on this show we're going to talk about more in the future. And then with basketball, hockey, the NFL playoffs and concerts all in full swing, there's always an event for everyone and you're not going to want to miss out, which is why I want to take a quick second to thank a fantastic sponsor of today's show, SeatGeek. With over 28 
million downloads. SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. You know, living in LA, I'm going to Rams, Chargers, Lakers games, hitting up a Kings game, a comedy show, going to Pantages, because I love musicals, don't hate. You know, there's just so many events I can enjoy with my wife or the kids or some friends. And SeatGeek is absolutely my go-to, especially because SeatGeek wants to make sure that you're getting a good deal. So when you're on the app, look for the green dots. Green means good deal, red means bad. And every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee, and SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. And don't worry, I got the hookup for you. Use code Phil for $20 off tickets as SeatGeek. That's $20 off your first purchase with promo code Phil. So make sure you click that link in the description to download the app. And then... That was 54-year-old Alec Murdoch, and depending on what's about to come to light, he's either grieving for his family or the perpetrator of a grisly double murder. But to understand this mind-bending tale of lies, theft, and betrayal, we need to go all the way back to the beginning. I'm talking back to 1920, when Randolph Murdoch Sr. was elected to the local prosecutor's office for coastal South Carolina, kicking off an 87-year, three-generation-long legal dynasty that held the post until 2005, ending with Alec's father, with Alec himself inheriting the fame, wealth, and power of his family name, rising through the ranks of high school, college, and law school, to join the private practice his great-grandfather started back in 1910. And he had deep ties throughout the community, serving in numerous organizations and donating to Republicans and Democrats alike, which is why it came as such a shock when he said he returned home around 10 at night on June 7, 2021, to find his wife and son shot dead at the rural estate, leading to that 911 call, with his wife Maggie being killed by a semi-automatic rifle and his 22-year-old son Paul by a shotgun. It was just this senseless, gruesome tragedy, and days later you had Alec's brothers grieving on Good Morning America. I got a call from, from Alec. Monday night, and as soon as I answered the phone, I knew something was wrong. Oh, man. He just told me, he said, come as fast as you can. Paul and Maggie have been hurt. But as investigators looked into these killings, they reportedly discovered information that prompted them to take a second look at another case, that of 19-year-old Stephen Smith. Smith's body was found on a Hampton County road just miles from the Murdoch property in 2015, but while his mother thinks that he was murdered, the mystery was left unresolved. And very notably, Smith had attended high school with Alec's other son, Buster, and the Highway Patrol's case notes back then included Buster's name nine times. But that's kind of just the appetizer for the feast of bizarre revelations that came out in September. Starting on the 4th, when just one day after resigning from his law firm, Alec calls 911 again to say this time he's been shot on the side of the road in Hampton County. I stop, I got a flat tire mm -hmm. and I stopped and somebody stopped to help me and when I turned my back they tried to shoot me. He was then taken to a hospital and treated for a superficial gunshot wound to the head, according to the police. But suspicions were already raised before he even got off the road because a bystander also called 911 saying that they saw him laying on the ground covered in blood and waving his hands around, but then adding, He looks fine, but it kind of looks like a setup. And they appeared to be onto something there because just days later, Alec admitted to staging the whole thing with a former client, giving him the gun and paying him to kill the ex-lawyer so that Buster would collect about $10 million in life insurance. Meanwhile, Alec announces that he's entering rehab for an opioid addiction. Then his law firm claims that he only resigned after it was discovered he embezzled funds from the firm and its clients. The police then opened an investigation into the death of Gloria Satterfield, the Murdoch family housekeeper and nanny for over 20 years. She had died in a so-called trip and fall accident at the Murdoch home in 2018. And while there doesn't appear to be any indication of foul play right now, what happened afterward is another issue. Because you have Satterfield children suing Alec for allegedly stealing money from them. With that relating to a settlement over the $500,000 wrongful death claim that her kids said was never paid out. But then we're still not done because at the same time, Alec gets slapped with another lawsuit related to an incident in 2019. This, when a boat that he owned crashed into a bridge with his son Paul and five others on board, killing 19-year-old Mallory Beach. Paul there getting indicted for boating under the influence and causing death with the crash to which he pled not guilty. But now this new lawsuit alleges Alec actually tried to orchestrate a cover-up and blame someone else, with a nurse saying that she witnessed Alec telling crash survivors not to speak to the authorities about what had happened. Now keep in mind, everything I just told you, from Alec having himself shot in the head to the theft and mysterious deaths, all came tumbling out into the spotlight over the course of just a month. And with it came an avalanche of indictments with charges ranging from computer crimes and money laundering to criminal conspiracy and forgery, with a total amount allegedly defrauded from his victims reaching nearly $8.5 million. But still, none of that even touches the focus of this story. That being in July of last year, the final biggest indictment came down on Alec, and that being the murder of his wife and son. Because you see, their deaths appear just as strange as the others haunting the Murdoch family. Right? Earlier that night, Alec reportedly called his wife Maggie and asked her to meet him at the estate to see his father before he died, which he did a few days later. According to a law enforcement source, she initially balked, proposing that they meet 
meet at the hospital instead, but eventually she agreed. And on the way to the property, she allegedly messaged a friend saying her husband's behavior felt fishy and adding, he's up to something. You also have prosecutors claiming that there's evidence putting Alec at the crime scene around 844 the night of the murder, which could definitely be damning because it falls within the window of time that the killings might have happened and Alec didn't make his 911 call until 10.07 p.m. Moreover, several sources say that he and Maggie had hit a rough patch in their marriage, with one saying behind the black ties and fancy dresses were miserable people. Though his legal defense argues that Alec had no problems with his family and that he was with his dementia-ridden mother and her caretaker on the night of the killings. But here's one of the key things. Even if the prosecution has a strong case here, some worry that Alec's immense influence in the state is going to impede a fair trial. With just one glaring reminder of that power coming when a portrait of his grandfather hanging in the courtroom reportedly had to be taken down. And then in jury selection, one person after another had to be excluded because they're a cousin of Alec, they've been to his house parties, they worked at his law firm, and so on. So finding jurors who hadn't heard of Alec or the case was almost impossible. But the trial is now finally underway this week with more than 250 potential witnesses lined up. And among those, you have Alec's only surviving son, his brothers, and his wife's sister. And as for the alleged motive here, prosecutors claim that he killed his family to win public sympathy before his financial crimes came out. And to back that up, they're expected to unveil evidence, including Google records and a Snapchat taken by Paul minutes before he was shot. But yeah, for this story, you're gonna have to buckle up. It's gonna take some time. This is expected to go on for a few weeks at least. Murdoch, if he's convicted, faces 30 years to life in prison. We'll have to wait to see what comes out next. And then from that, I'd like to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's show, Grammarly. Communication is key in any job, whether you're communicating through email, Slack, Discord, or whatever. And writing doesn't need to be your job, but good communication is important to help build strong relationships and get your projects moving forward. And sounding unconfident, indecisive, or even passive aggressive can hold you back professionally and hurt your team's productivity. And by downloading Grammarly and upgrading to Grammarly Premium, you get access to their premium tone rewrite suggestions that can help you with your tone and to come across more concise and confident in your writing, which is a huge help to keep projects moving forward in a timely manner, cutting down on the back and forth or even misunderstanding understandings. Plus, working in a fast-paced environment like getting a daily news show out, this tool has proven to be extremely helpful for me and my team when crunched for time. Once downloaded, Grammarly plugs into your routine immediately. It's completely free and integrates into Microsoft Word, Google Docs, and more. The right Tone can move your projects forward with the help of Grammarly. So go to Grammarly.com slash DeFranco to sign up for an account. And if you'd like to level up your writing and tone, upgrade to Grammarly Premium for 20% off. And then last week, we talked about the media and body image, specifically as it pertains to all these outlets saying that the toxic heroin chic look is back. And just as a heads up, this content focuses on serious issues regarding body image and eating disorders. And with us to get a better picture, we talked to Dr. Dara Greenwood, Dr. Kerry O'Grady, and Dr. Kimberly Dennis, with us discussing the harmful effects of social media treating bodies like a trend and how it can actually get into your head and perpetuate these negative messages and social comparison. And today we are going to go more into that, but we're going to take a stab at a more kind of hopeful spin. I know that that's weird for this show, but we'll be doing that by focusing on the way social media and the body positivity movement can also allow us to push back against these trends. Right, when heroin chic emerged, in the 90s, we didn't have social media, and there are pros and cons to that. Because social media can exacerbate these problems, but it can also be used as the solution. But over the last 10 years, places like Twitter and Instagram have also opened the door for massive conversations about mental health and body positivity. And this increased awareness on these subjects can be used to combat new and toxic trends like the resurgence of heroin chic. I think it'll be interesting to see how much backlash this apparently new trend might get, how much critical scrutiny. I wonder if it will have as much traction as it seems that it might be gaining when there can be these types of pushbacks that can happen at the level of social media. So I think it'll be interesting to see where the relative distribution is on kind of following this trend and supporting this trend versus kind of, you know, fighting against it or pointing out how problematic it is. And it's something we've already started to see happen, right? If you look at tweets referencing heroin chic and other related trends, you'll find a ton of people calling it out for its toxicity, trying to mitigate the danger that it could pose to another generation. And then when it comes to the Kardashians, who we referenced last week for being a major face for this problem, perpetuating unachievable standards, their new Hulu series actually faced tons of backlash after people made it clear, hey, we're not going to watch this because of the obsessive way they talk about weight loss and thinness. Right On that show, viewers are essentially watching them deal with their own insecurities in real time, but the way that they deal with it is harmful for those watching. And the cultural response to that can actually influence whether or not they continue spreading this kind of negative body talk. We forget that these people are humans too, who could, who very apparently have problems with their own bodies and the way that they view their bodies and the pressure that society puts on their bodies. And so they project that onto an audience. And I think that in future seasons of the show, we will not see as much weight-centric conversations, dangerous dieting, and all of the other negative things that they put on audiences this season because they got so much backlash from consumers being smart enough to say, we've had enough 
of this. Right, and this is all thanks to a lot of things, including the power given to consumers by the body positivity movement. As consumers, as citizens, you know, as concerned parents, as recovered people, we have a say. I think body positivity is going to stick around, and I'm, my hope is that the body positivity movement will, will get even louder. Right, and if you're unfamiliar, like what the body positivity movement is supposed to be is about loving and accepting and celebrating your body, no matter what it looks like. Saying no matter what size you are, you don't have to conform to beauty standards to be beautiful, which is especially helpful because they keep fucking changing so much. And even it's because they're trying to move more product, it's something that a lot of companies and fashion brands have gravitated towards over the last 10 to 15 years. And as it turns out, these kinds of images and rhetoric do make a difference. There is definitely evidence that um, body positivity and kind of expanded imagery, expanded diversity of body and, and beauty ideals is beneficial and important. But that also doesn't mean that the problem's fully solved, right? If it did, we wouldn't be talking about it on the show. There have been limitations in its influence and impact and even with the core of its message. Even some of the body positivity work can still keep people focused on their bodies and still focused on the value of appearance. You know, love the body you have and you're beautiful no matter what. It's like, but the punchline is still beauty. And there's still this relentless emphasis on beauty. And so you'll also see headlines either critiquing body positivity or even just shifting to body neutrality, which that essentially means accepting and respecting your body over loving it, right? Prioritizing what your body does and its functions over its looks, right? You don't have to love or hate your body. You just try to accept it and feel neutral about it. With a belief being that it can take away some of the pressures that some might feel. And a key thing for many is it takes appearance out of the focus. When we stop focusing on image so much, we get to a body neutral and I love the body neutral movement because it really works with whatever body you have and how to take care of it from a medical perspective, a mental perspective, and just an overall wellness perspective. Right, a lot of these terms we just didn't have in our vocabulary back in the 90s. And we definitely didn't have this kind of discourse and narratives around this to ground us. And I will say, well, I personally can kind of like eye roll at the overcomplicated way that, you know, we talk about certain things. I can't really do that here because I have so many fucking complicated feelings when it comes to, to weight and health and uh, the visuals and how I feel about my body. Which is why, you know, I think it's important we have these conversations, but also I want to use this opportunity to say, hey, there are support groups for those in recovery for people who are struggling, where you can connect with people who understand you and you don't have to feel alone. I think that social is actually much more beneficial to use as a support community for people who are going through the same things you are. There's also a really educational component of self-compassion on social media. Right, so it's not all negative. There are places that can actually lift people up. I know, it seems unheard of. But where other people from all around the world can say, hey, I've been there too, let me help. And I will say personally with this story, I don't know if, if torn is the right word, but I, uh, I'm not fully locked in on anything. Personally, I respect the idea of, of body neutrality. And it probably just speaks to, I need to work on myself a lot more, but I don't know how to accomplish that. And I know everyone is different, different approaches work for different people. Some gravitate towards body positivity, some to body neutrality. This is just where I'm at and how I feel. Because, and I'll, I'll probably get shit from a, a number of different people because nuance and, and people trying to figure things out in public, that usually doesn't go over well. But like with my health journey, there are a number of factors at play. I'm also, I, I deal with so many conflicting feelings. But for me personally, it's hard to be neutral about my body. Right, a number of things for me went hand in hand. Sure, I didn't like the way that I looked and I, I wanted to change that, but also I had health problems. But I also wanted to be stronger, more flexible. I wanted to feel good about like my ability to do things as I get closer and closer to 40. And for me, changing up my day-to-day -day diet for something that was sustainable and, and changing what I do as far as working out, like all, it helped all those things. What I found re-watching the full interviews and looking over this piece in general is, right, that focus on strength and appreciating what my body can do is actually in line with some body neutral beliefs, right, even though I'm not like putting that label on myself. So it definitely does have ways that it can make an impact, right? I can see where that has the power to resonate with someone. And then, and I feel like if you've been on a journey like this, maybe it, this resonates with you, seeing and feeling those changes helped me stick to it. Like for me personally, I feel like I had to focus on that or really anything that I'm trying to stick to because if I, if I don't have my hands on the rail, I'm just free falling through life. And I say all of this kind of mid journey. Right? I'm not at the top of the mountain and you know, for something that you maintain through your life and it's just a part of you, I don't even think there is necessarily a top of the mountain. So I'm also open to the idea that the, the mindset that I have right now over time could potentially turn toxic. But with all of that said, I think where I wanna end this is yes, this is a story. Yes, I'm very thankful we have experts on, but what I really hope from this segment is that we can actually have a conversation. And beyond that, maybe for you know one, two, three people, this is something 
something that, that really resonates with them and they can also talk about with the people in their real life. But yeah, let me know what you think about the, the story in general, body neutrality, uh, you know, if you think I'm a monster because of my take or you understand it, whatever. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. Whether it be this last story or whatever stood out to you most, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. And as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you Sunday.